in a lot of in a lot of movies you can you'll often have something moving straight moving up or moving down but there's also a type of ro uh, motion called rotation where things are moving either clockwise which i guess that's clockwise or anti-clockwise so typically the motion so let's put a title i guess rotation or rotational dynamics okay So instead of looking at the dynamics of linear or translational motion, which would be motion in a straight line that could, of course, be any one of three straight lines, we're going to be looking at rotational motion. So the motion of an object. Okay. So the motion of an object can typically be split up into a translational or translational but by translational I mean in a straight line okay it could be a straight line this way it could be this way translational and rotational components okay so rotation is typically going to be this way or could be this way, could be something moving in a circle. Uh, and sometimes in movie clips, there's a clip I'm about to show from um, James Bond movie, Live and Let Die, you'll see that you actually, in this case, you have this motion contains translational motion and it also contains rotational motion. But we can still analyze them separately. We can still split them up. So here's the clip. You goof, boy. Here's bridges two miles back. I sure am, boy. Ever heard of Evil Knievel? As you can see in that clip, what happened, you had James Bond coming, going in his uh, car, which was a bit fancier than that. Uh, he went over this hill, or ramp, and landed on the other side. But during that motion, the car itself, uh, it's kind of hard to draw here, but essentially it was spinning. You know, it was moving. Here's the car. Wheels, wheels, wheels. And maybe at some point it was like this, for example. The wheels would be up here. And maybe here, the wheels might be here. So the car, as well as moving in this kind of parabolic path, was also rotating. Okay? So it was spinning, as you could see. And we can analyze that clip. And the question is, what makes the car rotate? I mean, when you, put the, put the, you accelerate the car, it shoots over the ramp. Fair enough. The car accelerates along the ground, gets to the end of the ramp, as you know, with projectile motion. And then it has this velocity in this direction, and it has a velocity in this direction, one up, one horizontally. And it's able to uh, move in this projectile path. But what made it rotate? Exactly. The thing that makes it rotate is the bridge. So the bridge, as, you'll see, as you can see in the clip, the bridge is kind of bent. It's, it kind of, as you get onto the bridge, what happens is it kind of twists. The edges of the bridge twist. And that twisting motion provides something we call a torque or a turning force, which causes the car to spin. And it does about, I guess it does about one or one or two rotations as it goes over here. And we're going to, today we're going to look at torque, we're going to look at something called angular acceleration. We're going to look mostly at rotational motion. And the, the laws of physics are similar for rotational as they are for uh, linear motion. In fact, you, you have equations, remember we had F equals MA. Well, in rotation we have 
Talk equals I alpha. What's I, what's alpha? Well, I haven't talked about that yet. Uh, but these are quantities that are rotational equivalents of linear quantities. So let's, uh, let's, do, let's actually look at that. So I'm going to clean the board a bit. So just keeping on that part. So we're going to say that every translational quantity has a rotational equivalent. It's also true for every equation in linear dynamics, right? So if we had something like linear, let's say kinematics. So if we have V equals U plus AT for motion in a straight line, we have a rotational equation which relates the, ang relates the angular velocity, the time, and maybe the angular acceleration. So let's look at the first quantity we had was displacement. So on this side, I'm going to have translational. I'll try to stick to this. Translational quantity. And over here, I'm going to have rotational. Maybe here. rotational quantity. And the first thing that we looked at when we looked at kinematics right at the beginning of this course was displacement. We used the symbol S and that represents, for example, going from left to right. And we, we gave it a sign. We said that up was positive and that down was negative. And we said that this was positive as well. Uh, and maybe that this direction is negative. So we have to give it a sign so that we can distinguish between motion going up and motion going down, so that when we incorporate acceleration, the signs come out the right way. For rotation, the convention is that anti-clockwise is positive. Okay? Anti-clockwise is positive. There's a V there. So, for example, um, this direction, if you like. Anything going anti-clockwise. Um, so the, the quantity that is equivalent to displacement is something called angular displacement. And the symbol that we use is theta for an angle. So displacement, remember that's typically you measure that in meters, but angular displacement, we actually measure it in, in a quantity called a radian or radians. You could also measure it in degrees. But the equations don't work out if you use degrees. You actually have to convert everything to radians. Okay. So another quantity in translational motion is velocity. And typically we have the symbol V for velocity. V equals U plus A T, etc. In the rotational case for things spinning, okay, this is spinning stuff, we have this quantity called angular velocity. And we use the symbol omega. Now this is omega. It's omega. It looks like a W, but it's actually got these curly ends here. It's, it's a, these are all vectors, so we should really put a, a line above it to represent the fact that it's a vector. So we have this quantity angular velocity which is the rotational equivalent of linear velocity. So this could be going in this direction, for example. Now, to get the direction of the angular velocity, we need to use our right hand. Okay? And the way it works, it's the easiest way for me, and I think it probably for you, is to you take your right hand and the thumb is pointing in the direction of the angular velocity, and the fingers point in the... Uh, the, rotate, the direction that the, the object's moving in. Let me draw, exam for example, draw a, cir a circle. So here we have an object. Say we have a mass, or a, could be a ball, on a, on a string. Okay, the ball's on a string, and it's moving in a circle like that. Okay? And the, so the ball's moving in a circle. You take your thumb, the fingers match the arrows here, and the thumb would be pointing upwards, as long as you use your right hand. 
So if you use your right hand, the thumb will tell you the direction of the angular velocity vector. So for this mass, it could be, perfect example would be that this could be, say, the Earth. And this could be, this center could be the Sun, and the Earth rotates about the Sun. And if the convention is to have the angular velocity omega pointing in this direction. So this would be the direction of omega, because I'm taking my right hand, the fingers represent the path of the Earth around the Sun, and the thumb tells you the direction of the angular velocity vector. It's actually um, that is not so, in so obvious. I'll give you an example. Here's a wheel. Okay, here we have a rotating object. So the angular velocity of this wheel, okay, let me get this right. If I take my thumb, if I rotate the wheel in this direction, the angular velocity is pointing towards you. If I rotate it in this direction, the angular velocity is pointing to the ceiling, okay? Because we're using the right hand. And if I spin it really fast, and I'm not gonna do that today, but if I did spin it really fast, what you'll see, it actually becomes difficult to change its direction. It's almost like it has a magic vector shooting upwards to the ceiling, and that vector wants to point in that direction. And if you try to get that vector to point in this direction, you have to apply a torque I have to try to twist the wheel. And this is essentially, or this is actually why you don't fall off your bicycle. Because if you're on your bicycle, your wheels are spinning. So you're on your, this is, I mean, this looks like a bike, right? So your wheel's spinning, and you have this angular velocity vector that shoots out this way. Okay, you can actually imagine the angular velocity of the vector to be this part of this. And the angular velocity vector points out, so if you're, your wheel, it doesn't want to do that. It's hard to do that. And the faster you go on your bike, the less likely you are to fall off. And if you go really slow, you're likely to fall off because the vector, the angular velocity vector, is weak. Okay, more about that in a minute. Okay. So we have this vector called angular velocity. Now, omega is very useful. Remember, angular velocity is called omega. And the reason why omega is so useful is because when you spin a body, like a mass or a, a ball or a chair, I don't know, or a person or a car, the angular velocity of every single point on that body is the same. Every single part of it. That's what we call a rigid body. So if you have a, an, a mass, could have some, let's say it looked like that, okay? It's like a blob of clay, it could be anything. And if you rotate it about some axis, so here's the rotation axis. So you can imagine this thing is spinning about this x. Every point, take a little mass here, take a little mass here, take a little mass here. Every one of these masses has the same angular velocity. So continuing with this uh, uh, linear versus translational stuff. If, let's say we take this, it's become a bit blobby, let's say we take this mass. So we have a mass, so in linear, remember, linear or translational, linear or translational, objects have mass, right? Symbol M measured in kilograms. So this blobby object that I drew over here, which is something like this, okay, this, this is my mass. This has a mass m. And the mass tells you how hard it is to move something or to accelerate it. Let's say just move. Okay, the bigger, bigger objects, they're harder to move. They're harder to move from Zero, they're essentially harder to accelerate, let's say. So the mass measures how hard it is to accelerate something. If we think about the rotation of this object, so that would be just what we have here is we're thinking about just accelerating it. If we try to rotate it, then it depends where the mass is, how it's distributed. It also depends where the rotation axis is. So if we think about the rotation of that object, 
let's say rotation of the object, then we have this quantity called moment of inertia. And we use the symbol I. And this tells us, I tells us how difficult it is to rotate something. So if, for example, um, again, going back to the wheel, it's quite easy for me to rotate the wheel about this axis, about the center. But if I try to rotate it about the rim, it's a much bigger torque on my fingers because all of the wheel is moving about this point. So here's my fingers. If I hang it like that, this is the axis of rotation. I can't do that for very long because there's a lot, all the mass is over here. The mass is over here and the axis is here. So it's moving about that point. Whereas if I just hold it here and let it rotate, it's much easier. Okay, so it depends on the distribution of mass. And that distribution of mass is encompassed in this quantity called I, which is the moment of inertia. So for example, for a wheel, so for a wheel, that's the one I just had up, if you rotate the wheel about the center, so rotate about center, If you rotate it about the center, then I is equal to one half m r squared, where m is the mass of the wheel, and r is the radius of the wheel. So if I try to spin this wheel about the center, the moment of inertia, the difficulty of how, to, how hard it is for it to spin about its center is a half mr squared. But if I try to rotate this wheel, let's see if I've got enough space, about, let's say we take the same wheel, let's become a bit non-round, let's say we take the same wheel and we try to rotate that wheel about this point, then the moment of inertia now is actually 3 upon 2 m r squared, where m and r have the same meaning. So if I try to rotate it about here, it's much harder to rotate. It's much harder to get the thing to spin up. And that difficulty of how hard it is to rotate is contained in this quantity i, which, which will depend on the distribution. It also depends on where the rotation axis is. Okay. Continuing with this uh, linear versus rotational kind of um, quantities, we're going to look at other things. So you, again, we've been through kinematics and dynamics. So one thing with the translational, one translational quantity that's important, translational quantity, something to get something moving is force. So we know that the force, F, is equal to the mass times the acceleration, Newton's second law. Okay? So if you have some mass, you apply a force to it, it will accelerate at an acceleration A, and that A is given by this equation, F equals MA. Again, you know, these are probably these are going to be vectors. So the mass is a measure of how hard it is to accelerate something. In the rotational uh, case, let's say, the rotational quantity, the equivalent rotational quantity, is something called torque. Right? The torque. And we use the symbol, we use the symbol tau. Okay? So tau, if we, again, if we draw our object, okay, there's our, our mass. If we, if we apply a force, say, to this mass at this point, so we apply a force F, at a distance, let's call that distance R, away from this X, which is the rotation axis, okay, then 
provided these are perpendicular at 90 degrees, then the tau, the, the torque of F about this point O is given by tau equals uh, FR. And this is true provided F and R are at 90 degrees. We use the symbol perpendicular for 90 degrees. That's not always going to be the case. So we, we would like to know how to calculate tau if F and R are not at 90 degrees to each other. And it's, not, it's actually really straightforward. Essentially, if F is coming out at some angle, so I try to, it's like if you try to, um, if you, you're trying to tighten a, a wrench, tight, tighten a nut with a wrench. If you want to tighten a nut with a wrench, you, you would always try to do it uh, perpendicular to the wrench direction. I think that's going to definitely be easier if I draw it. Um, in fact, let's get rid of that as well. So if we, have a, if we have a wrench, let's say we have a wrench or a, or a spanner, wrench or a spanner, I guess it's the same thing. So if we have a wrench, and here's our wrench, I guess, and you're trying to, you're trying to get this, this is, where, this is where the nut is. You have a nut here, okay? Uh, this would be the rotation axis. And let's say we apply a force in this direction. All right, there's our F, and here we have this angle would be theta. So if we try to apply the force in this direction, it would be pretty stupid, of course. I mean, naturally, you wouldn't do that because it's much harder to um, turn your nut if you apply the force in this direction. It makes common sense to want to do it that way. But if we applied it in this direction, then it's the amount of this force that goes upwards that causes the thing to turn. So we can split that force, right? We can draw a little triangle. We could say, so what I'm trying to do is magnify that, put it into here. Here's my F. Okay, let's see. try to keep the writing nice. Uh, here's my 90 degrees. Here's my theta. If that's F, I can give it two arrows because it's a resultant vector. Then this part, as you know, is F cosine theta. And this part is F sine theta. And this is the useful bit. This is the bit that does work, if you like, or that, that helps it turn. So if we were to calculate tau from this triangle, it would be F sine theta multiplied by R. So we can just simply write tau equals F sine theta multiplied by R, where the R is the distance uh, from, uh, let's call that A, and then you're going to call that O. The distance from A to O. Okay? All right. And just to hopefully clarify that, if we take this equation, this equation says tau equals F sine theta. So what if theta is zero? What's the sine of theta? Right. So if, if theta is zero, the sine of theta is zero, which would mean that F would be applying itself along here, and it wouldn't turn at all. So there's no turning force. So this tells us that the amount of turning force depends on the angle. The optimum would be this direction. If it was in this direction or this direction, there would be no turning force. You wouldn't turn it. After having looked at these quantities, rotational versus translational quantities, that would be what we, what we, want, what we next want to do is we want to look at Newton's laws of motion. So we've looked at Newton's laws of motion earlier on in the class, but we looked at it only for translational or for, for motion in a straight line. Now we're going to look at Newton's laws of motion for rotating quantities. So recap, because I guess it was a while ago. So Newton's laws of motion. A right, while ago, it's like, well, a while ago for Newton, for sure. Um, so in the linear case, right, the case that we studied earlier, if you have a mass 
m, and it's traveling at, say, a velocity v, then we could say that it has a momentum. Remember, we use the symbol p for momentum, which is side as mv. And Newton's first law, all right, so let's have this, let's have a number one here. Newton's first law says that if there are no external forces, then things will continue in a straight line without any change in velocity. Everybody will continue in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless acted on by an external impressed force. This has obviously been stuck in my head for many years. So what they're saying, if the net force, if F net equals zero, then the V is constant, which also means that the momentum P, because P is just MV, okay, is also constant. So things will continue in a straight line unless there's some force acting on them. So it's the, the example would be something floating out in space. Okay, it would just continue floating in that direction. So that's Newton's first law of motion okay, for things moving in straight lines. Right? Yeah, up, down, left, right. Now we apply Newton's, look at Newton's law of motion for rotating objects. So Newton's law, is, you know, it's the first law for rotation. So instead of momentum, so here we have linear momentum, if you're thinking about rotation, then we want to think of something called angular momentum. So angular momentum is a bit trickier to understand um, than linear momentum, but it's a really powerful concept. So as I say, for, for stuff moving in a straight line, could be up, down, could be left to right, you have this quantity called momentum, as you know. It's like a car moving along a road. It has a momentum that we call P. Now, if something's rotating, you have, you have this quantity called angular momentum. So Newton's first law for rotation says that if you have an object, it's moving in a circle, let's say, Here's our mass, and the circle, uh, arrow scheme to go in the same direction, uh, and this mass moves in a circle, a distance r from the center, and you could say, let's say it has a velocity v, then this mass has something called angular momentum. So the angular momentum, we use the symbol L, equals i times omega. So instead of P, we use L. So this is called the angular momentum. Remember, this is the moment of inertia. Inertia. And of course, this is the angular velocity. Angular velocity. So you see the similarity you have for linear, we have P equals MV, where mass tells you how hard it is to push something. For the rotational case, we have L equals I omega, where I is how hard it is to rotate something. Uh, omega just replaces V. So Newton's first law would say, if there are no torques, no external, let's say, torques, all right, remember that's our tau, then the angular momentum, L, will be constant. Okay. So they see the similar in the linear case, if there are no forces, the momentum's constant. In the rotating case, something spinning round, if there are no external torques, so if there's say, in this case, if this was say the Earth going around the Sun, there are no external torques then the angular momentum will stay constant. So the Earth going around the Sun is a good example, which I'm going to try to do here quickly. Because it, this idea of the angular momentum being constant, it explains orbits, any orbit. It doesn't have to be circular. It can be elliptical. Anything going in an orbital path could be an asteroid. I mean, the Moon is not particularly... It doesn't have a very circular orbit. It's more of an, elli more of an ellipse, isn't it? So... 
let's say we have the Earth around the Sun. Here's the Earth. Here's the Sun. So the Earth is moving. There's a force of gravity, Fg, between the Earth and the Sun. Earth pulls on the Sun. Sun pulls on the Earth. Newton's, Newton's third law. And it's moving, let's say, in this direction, V, but it's obviously moving in a circle. Now, the line connecting the Earth and the Sun, we could draw here. Okay, that could be our R. And if you look at the torque, look at the torque provided by the force. Look at the angle between the two of them. There isn't one. So the angle between the force of gravity and the, um, like the, line, the moment arm, if you like, or the R, the angle is zero. So if we look at the torque, tau, we end up with F R sine theta, that's F G, which is just F G R sine zero, sine of uh, zero, because there's no angle between the two of them, which is equal to zero. So tau equals zero. In other words, there are no external torques for anything orbiting. And that's true for anything that has a central force. So now we can explain why you get orbits. And we don't care if it's circular or non-circular. When we looked in, at circular motion earlier on, we just really talked about circular orbits. And we said that the force is perpendicular to the velocity, so it causes it to keep going in a circle. But now, with the more advanced concept of angular momentum, we can actually see that because there are no torques, things will continue orbiting forever, unless, say, you attach a rocket to the Earth or something like that. So we've just looked at Newton's first law, which says that if there's no forces, then the momentum's constant. Or if it's rotating, if there are no torques, the angular momentum's constant. So now I'm going to look at Newton's second law. Okay, so a, re a recap. Poor Newton. There you go. Newton's second law. Again, we start with the translational case, right? Translation, which is our straight line. Newton's second law says that, well, in, in, as an equation, it says F equals ma. OK? So therefore, which says that the rate of change of momentum depends on the force applied. OK? So rate of change of momentum comes in here. Remember, that's just mv minus u over t, isn't it? So this is the rate of change of momentum, otherwise known as uh, uh, force. So Newton's second law just says that F equals ma. We take a mass, we apply a force to it, or we pull it. We say F, a force F, then it will accelerate. The acceleration will be given by F divided by m. Okay. Now, for rotation, remember the rot now we're looking at rotation. Newton's second law well, we're going to be talking about torques and we're going to talk about angular momentum, aren't we? So Newton's second law says that tau, the torque tau, equals I times by alpha. Ah, a new symbol. Now alpha is the angular acceleration. Imagine if you uh, spin something up, right? So the angular acceleration would be um, how fast this spins up. So if we spin it, it's going to get a little faster. Then it may go constant. But while it's um, spinning up from zero to some speed, there's an angular acceleration alpha. And alpha also has a sign, right? I doesn't. If I take this. At the moment, let's get my thumb, make sure I have my right hand. Okay. So at the moment, alpha, because it's spinning up, is pointing upwards. If I turn it like this, then alpha has changed direction. Okay. So the angular acceleration alpha is equal to delta omega over delta t. In a similar case with Newton's law, we know that a is delta v over delta t. Okay? So in the angular case, this is alpha. right? 
alpha is the angular acceleration. So as a summary for the equations, I'm just going to write up um, the linear and the rotational equations. So linear, remember translation. I'm going to put that here. And rotation, I'm going to put in this common, column. Rotational equivalent, let's say. Okay. So if we're just looking at dynamics, then we'd have F equals MA. In this case, we'd have tau equals I alpha. For momentum, P equals MV. For rotating, L equals I omega. Kinetic energy, a half MV squared. Rotational kinetic energy, you can put rotation here if you like, a half I omega squared. Work, force times displacement, but if it's rotating, work equals tau times the angular displacement. So there's a, there's, the analogy is pretty clear, right? For, this is for dynamics. We could look at kinematics. You can almost fill these in for me as you go through. So for kinematics, you have these equations. Remember, kinematics is we don't know what causes. It's, it's, it's not about the cause of the motion. We just look at the outcome, the velocity, the acceleration. So in kinematics, Again, linear, draw a line, rotation. So linear, we might have V equals U plus AT. What would we have on the other side? Exactly. Omega final equals omega initial plus alpha T. Use an I here for initial. Uh, here we have S equals UT plus one half a t squared. On this situation, we'd have for the rotating case, we have theta equals omega initial times by t plus a half alpha t squared. And finally, if we take those two equations, we can get an equation which doesn't have time in it, which is often very useful. v squared minus u squared is 2as, vectors, vectors, vectors. And in this case, we'd have omega final squared minus omega initial squared equals 2 alpha theta. Remembering that the direction is given by the right thumb, uh, the right hand of the thumb tells you the direction of the angular velocity. And finally, as the last part, we can actually link these two. So how do you link the rotational quantity with the linear quantity? They're linked via something called the radius or the, the moment arm or eff effectively they're linked by R. Here's an example. Um, if something moves, say, from here to here through an angle theta, so here's our mass M, say it went from, say, here to here, and this was R, this was R, then that distance S, we can show that that distance S is equal to R theta. So R is the thing that links S and theta. If we take the time derivative, if we, or if we do S over T, you get V. So S over T equals V equals R theta over T, which is the same as R omega. So here we have the second equation, V equals R omega. Remember, R is the thing that links the rotational quantity with the linear quantity. And then we can take the time derivative of this, or divide by t, okay? We'd have v over t, which is equal to a, which is going to be r omega over t, which is r, excuse me, r omega over t, which is simply r alpha. All right. So we have these three equations. We have s equals r theta. We have V, Let's, I can actually simplify that one, 
V equals R omega. And this one we're going to simplify. We just have A equals R alpha. Now I've seen students get a little worried here because you're thinking, well, we have this rotational acceleration A, but I thought it was V squared over R. Well, this is actually the tangential acceleration. And I'm going to show you what I mean by drawing it. Here's an example. Watch this clip. This is a clip from, uh, uh, I, don't, I think it's Roger Moore, Moonraker. So let's have a look at that. This is the centrifuge training. It simulates the gravity force you feel when shot into space. The speed is controlled by the instructor from up there. Hmm. Why not try it? Why not? Strap yourself in firmly. Yes, Doctor. Now your arms. That's to prevent you from knocking yourself out. I see. How uh, fast does it go? It can go up to 20 Gs, but that would be fatal. 3 Gs is equivalent to takeoff pressure. Most people pass out at 7. You make a great salesman. You don't have to worry. This is what we call a chicken switch. You just keep your finger on that button. The moment the pressure gets too much for you, release the button and the power's cut off. Just like that? Come on, Mr. Bond. A 70-year-old can take three Gs. Well, the trouble is there's never a 70-year-old around when you need one. Want me? Mr. Drax says to telephone him. All right, I'll call him from my office. You go ahead. I'll be right back. The instructor will supervise the session. Enjoy yourself. Yes. We're taking good care of him. So in that clip, what do, we what do we have going on? So we have this 
big arm of the centrifuge. We have uh, James Bond sitting in here, okay, looking terrified. This is our distance, R. And we know that it's moving in some kind of circle. Okay, maybe more circular than that, but it's, it's essentially moving in a circle. I think I can do a slightly better job than that. It's, it's moving uh, effectively, let's say like this, okay? It's moving in a circle. So we're looking, we, we've got a bird's eye view of James Bond in that movie clip. We're looking down on it. So he's moving in a circle. He actually experiences two accelerations because he spins up, spins up because he goes from zero to moving at some speed. So when he does that, he has two, there are two forms of acceleration. One is the radial acceleration, which is V squared over R. The other one is the tangential acceleration, AT, which is R alpha. So he actually experiences both. And if I draw a little um, mass, here, a little object here, representing James Bond, then you can see that one acceleration is here and one acceleration is here. So the net acceleration would be in this direction. This would be the net A. And A is going to equal AR comma AT, where this would be in the radial direction and this is in the tangential direction. In other words, this direction. So he experiences two. In general, this one is much bigger than this one. You can kind of see that if we write um, AR equals R omega squared, the radial acceleration depends on omega squared. And the square means it's really large. So that rate is it's just, it's because this is, the, this is the fact that he's going in a circle. This is because he's spinning up. So we've been looking at, at linear motion and rotational motion. We looked, we studied linear for quite a bit. We've used it with various movie clips, people falling, cars flying, but we hadn't really looked at the rotational part. Today we've been looking at ro the rotational and we see that the equations of rotational dynamics are very similar to the equations of linear dynamics. Remember linear straight line, ro rotation moving in a circle. And one quantity that comes out of this is really important and hard for students to understand is angular momentum. Momentum is pretty easy because you just have this, you know, momentum, how hard it is to push something, speed it up or slow it down, right? It's a measure of the change in momentum. But how hard it is to spin something, you, that, that depends on the change in angular momentum. And angular momentum is bizarre, but it's a really important thing. The reason it's important is because it's because of angular momentum, because the angular momentum of the Earth, means the Earth, going around the Sun is constant, because the angular momentum, L of the Earth, never changes, it's the reason why the Earth, for the next four to five billion years, let's say, before the Sun becomes a, you know, a red giant, etc., the Earth will continue moving around the Sun, because there are no forces acting on it, it's in a vacuum. So it's angular momentum is constant forever as far as we're concerned because I'm not worried about four billion years from now. <laughs>